All right, this is Physics 1C for November 10th. And tonight we're talking about inductors. We're talking about magnetic energy density, the energy they store. And then we're going to talk about three different types of circuits, the RL circuit, the LC circuit, and the LRC circuit. In case you don't remember what these things are, R is resistor, C is capacitor, and L is what we learned about last time, which is the inductor. Uh, an inductor, just to remind you, uh, so the symbol we use for this uh, is L. We call it an inductor. The idea is it's a device that's made up of a bunch of coils. So the symbol for it in a diagram is going to look something like this. An inductor is basically just anything that has a lot of coils and any type of a circuit can have an inductance. Um, we said that there is uh, some things that we can say about inductors. Uh, for example, the, the EMF across an inductor is given by this expression. Uh, you take the inductance L, which is measured in Henry's, and you multiply by di dt. The negative sign indicates the fact that when the current in, this, in a circuit decreases, the EMF across the inductor uh, is going to be in the same direction. So if di dt is negative, you get negative, negative. EMF is going to be in the same direction as the external current. And when the current in the system tries to increase, then the EMF and the inductor opposes that. An inductor basically always tries to oppose any changes in currents. Yep, I'm recording today's lecture. Yep. Um, so, yeah, inductor, EMF and the inductor, like that. So an inductor has the effect, uh, basically, of either smoothing out current changes, resisting current changes, however you really want to think about it. Um, what we're going to learn now is about how you can actually store energy inside of a conductor. I think we'll do these first two, and then we're going to watch kind of a general video about them. All right. So the energy stored in an inductor. So what we'll do to start this off is to say that um, we'll think about power for an inductor. So we'll imagine that we have a system where we have an inductor with an inductance L and a circuit that carries uh, a current that's flowing, uh, let's say, in this direction here. And we say the current is I. And maybe that current is changing in some kind of a way. And we want to kind of understand something about what's happening with the inductor. So we'll talk about um, the power um, kind of delivered to the inductor, we could say. Now, in general, we have this expression that tells us that power is related to current multiplied by the potential difference, uh, or written in another way, that power is equal to um, current multiplied by EMF. So what we'll do is we'll say in this case that power um, is kind of the rate of change of energy, which we could write like this. We could represent U to be kind of the energy associated with the inductor here. So we're going to say that uh, U is going to represent the energy in the inductor. We'll just say the energy in L for the inductor. Um, and say that power is the rate at which it changes. So one thing I'll say is that this inductor, what it can do is it can either um, have power in the sense that it's, uh, that it's delivering current to the circuit, we're going to have power in the sense that it's it's receiving current from the circuit. And the way that that works is that when you have current flowing through a system like this, there's going to be a magnetic field that's set up within the system. Um, I'm not going to draw this very well, but you've got magnetic fields that are produced because there's current flowing through here like this. And the part of the reason why the inductor resists changes in current is that um, as the current flows through it, it takes time to build up this magnetic field. And as the magnetic field builds up, it's like the inductor is kind of sapping power away from the circuit, sapping energy away from the circuit to kind of build that magnetic field. But then once the magnetic field is built up, if you turn the current off and there's a and there's some kind of a path along which the, the current can flow, then if you if you stop the current from flowing in some way, then the magnetic fields can basically deliver energy to the circuit. And uh, in general, I think we're going to say that when the inductor is delivering power, its power is going to be positive, And when it's building up a magnetic field, its power is going to be negative. But we're just interested in, in kind of this piece of it, the energy itself, the energy that's stored up in that magnetic field. All right, so we'll say the power in the inductor is going to be related to the rate of change of energy in the inductor. And that's going to be equal to <clears throat> the current I 
multiplied by the EMF. And in this case, we're going to use the EMF in the inductor itself because we're interested to the energy in the inductor itself. So the EMF across the inductor is given by this expression here. We're not going to worry about the, um, the negative sign for now because after all, it's just going to show up as an overall sign in the equation that we're going to do here. So we're going to just write it like that. And then we'll just multiply both sides of our equation by dt to clear the denominators. So we'll end up getting um, du is equal to i times L. I should use the same i's here, actually. So i is going to represent the instantaneous current. That's often what we do in this book. to right. So it's going to be i times L, and then a di right here. And now we're going to think about what happens as the energy is stored up in the inductor as we go from 0 up to some current i. And on the left side, this will just be kind of we're integrating du. So this is going to be just the total energy that gets in, that gets stored in the inductor over that process. I'll put a little L right here to represent this is the energy in the inductor. Uh, this equation right here, this is pretty simple, right? It's I times L. L is a, a constant, basically, right? Uh, so the integral of I di, what would that be? Basically just doing this. What's that integral give you? Yeah, so this is going to be 1 half times the inductance multiplied by the current that flows in the system squared. That's going to be the energy in the inductor. And yeah, we talked last time about how inductance is this idea that when you try to increase current in a circuit, the inductor is going to resist the attempt to do that and kind of push back on you. And as a result, it means that you can't make the current go from zero up to 10 amps instantly, just like you can't take an object and accelerate it from zero to 10 meters per second instantly due to the fact that it has mass. And the larger the mass of an object, the harder it is to change its velocity, right? It's very hard to take a dump truck that's moving along the road at 50 miles an hour and just stand in front of it and slow it down, right? You need a big braking system to make that happen. And even when you try to stop a dump truck from moving, uh, it's going to take time, right? You hit the brakes, it's not going to instantly drop to zero. And the reason for that is because it has mass. It has inertia. It wants to keep going. That's what Newton's first law tells us, that objects that have mass tend to keep moving in a straight line unless they're acted on by an external force, right? So in the same sense here, that once you have an inductor in a circuit, it basically endows the circuit with a kind of mass in a way that stops you from instantly accelerating the electrons in it up to a certain current. It stops you from instantly decelerating the electrons in the current down to a certain speed. Um, yeah, and so that, that means that inductance itself is similar to a measurement of mass. So you can compare this to, um, and we said last time that I was like velocity, so you can compare this to a type of kinetic energy, which would be written as like one half mv squared. Right. So the energy stored in an inductor is kind of like kinetic energy because once the inductor has this energy, it tends to want to keep that energy, just like a moving baseball wants to keep its energy as well. Um, this energy is stored in the magnetic field of the inductor. And just to make it less, less um, easier to understand, it's just the, the energy stored in the magnetic field of the coils, right? There's coils and there's a magnetic field that's produced there. Now, one of the things that uh, we were talking before class, one of the things that Mr. Meower mentioned uh, is that when you're talking about solenoids inside of circuits, there's multiple considerations. He mentioned temperature, but also interference from surrounding components. These, uh, these inductors have the effect of kind of generating really high fluxes through them because of the, the coils that are there. So one thing you have to be able to do in electrical circuits is you have to be able to shield the um, the magnetic fields from one portion of the circuit from affecting the magnetic fields of the other portion of the circuit. Is that what you were referring to, Miaris? When you were talking about interference? Yeah, exactly. So shielding these magnetic fields becomes really important, especially when you have electrical circuits that have all kinds of components inside of them. You probably have multiple, multiple inductors and capacitors and resistors and all kinds of other little pieces, diodes and all kinds of stuff we haven't even talked about yet. Um, but yeah, the fact that these things, they, they want to store magnetic fields. And so if you have an external element that has a change in current in any way, it's going to affect this, this system right here. And it might create some interruption in the current that's flowing, 
which then might kind of in turn affect the readout on a, a, a display. Um, it might affect um, you know the numbers that are showing up on a device that you're using to measure things and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. Okay, so that's the energy stored in an inductor. Now I can't remember because we got started a little later. Did I get, yeah, okay. I don't think I have a problem specifically associated with this. Um, just something that we kind of want to know about the energy stored in an inductor. All right. So let's move into magnetic energy density then. So this type of energy, since it's stored inside of a magnetic field, um, if we look at a specific case, um, we can actually talk about the way in which that energy is stored kind of in the region around it, um, the type of density of the energy itself. So let's scroll down to where, let me make this a little bigger. So how do we do this? Let's do the um, the energy density of a solenoid. You could do this really with any type of device, but a solenoid is probably the simplest. Okay, so we have a solenoid. Um, I'm just gonna, let's actually draw a solenoid because we're gonna need some of the shapes of it and stuff like that. So let's take a, Something like this. Let's copy it. Put it right here. Draw some lines. So we've got like a tube around which we're going to wrap some coils. So there's our tube. And we're going to wrap some coils around this. And what we'll do is we'll say that this is the and that we can't see the opening to. Um, we'll say the area of this end cap here is A, and then we're just gonna wrap coils around this. So we'll have coils that go around like this, and then behind here, come up here, and then back like this. And all of these coils are connected, so I'll draw one of them like this, so that you can see that it goes back around the back, and then it comes up here, and the coil comes here, and this just repeats itself. So we've got a bunch of coils, some number of turns per unit area, And let's make it like this. So we'll say that we have current flowing in this way. And it comes out the other side here. So that along all the pieces of this, the current is flowing kind of in this direction here. Uh, what direction is the magnetic field that's set up by such an object gonna look like? Is it gonna point to the left or the right inside the solenoid? A few people saying right, a few people saying left. It's definitely going to point to the right. The magnetic field inside of here is going to go this way. And I, I'm going to draw some extra lines here. Every time I draw these, um, I feel like it looks like worse than if I hadn't done it. But the idea is that there is a magnetic field. It kind of looks like this. It's a dipole type of magnetic field, right? But um, I, I don't think it looks particularly good to draw them on there. So we're just going to say there's a magnetic field at the core of the solenoid that points to the right, just like this. And what we'd like to do now is to understand how much energy is actually stored in the magnetic field, and specifically the energy density, so the energy per unit volume. Energy density means energy divided by volume. Just like density is mass over volume, charge density is charge over volume, energy density is energy over volume. Okay. Okay, now according to the equation right here, it says we need to take one half the inductance of the solenoid multiplied by I squared. Now, we did this at the end of class last time, but it's a really short calculation, so I'm going to go through it again. In general, the inductance of any object is equal to the number of turns in the object. So this one is going to have some number of turns in, and let's say that it has a length L for the solenoid. I forgot to write those down. Um, so the inductance of a solenoid is N multiplied by the flux through the, through the object uh, divided by the current flowing in the system. Okay. For this, the magnetic field of a solenoid is equal to mu naught multiplied by the number of turns per unit length and then multiplied by the current flowing. So the inductance of the solenoid is gonna be the number of turns 
times magnetic flux, and magnetic flux is going to be magnetic field times area. The area here is going to be the area A, so NBA over I. And then we do replace the B here, so it's N times mu naught, and then we have N over L, and then we have the area A, and then it's divided by I. So this ends up being equal to uh, mu naught N squared. Oh, I left out the I, didn't I? Because the B has an I in it as well. Let me just erase this. So let me, let me go through that again. So it's N, which is there, times B, which is mu naught N over L, and there's the I, and then times A. The I's cancel out, and what we get is mu naught N squared N times N, and the I's cancel, so there's an A, and then there's divided by the length. So that's the inductance of a solenoid. That right there. Okay. All right. So we're trying to find energy per unit volume. We have an expression for the solenoid right here. We're going to plug that into our equation up here at the top. So we want to take this and plug it into the equation that says that the energy that's stored in the, in the solenoid is going to be equal to 1 half times L. So we just wrote down what L is here. So L is mu naught times N squared times A divided by L. And then we have to multiply by current squared. Right. Now what we want to do is we want to understand something about the energy density specifically associated with a magnetic field. So what we're going to do is we're going to reverse this around and we're going to eliminate the current in favor of getting the magnetic field back into this equation here, right? So if we rearrange that equation there, um, it can tell us that, let me write this in a different color. I believe the current here is going to be equal to, so we multiply the L over here. So it's going to be B times L divided by mu naught and then divided by big N, right? We're gonna take that and we're gonna plug it in right there for the current. Now that we've already used that equation, we're gonna scroll down. So now what we're gonna get is the energy stored in our solenoid is equal to one half mu naught N squared A over L times I squared. So now we plug this in um, I guess I'll do the squared part second. So it's BL over mu naught times N. We're squaring that. And now we get the energy stored in our solenoid. It's going to be equal to... A lot of this stuff's going to cancel, right? Did I leave anything out? Yes, you got, I'm just going to slow down for a second. Anyone see any mathematical errors or anything? Did I leave any things off? Looks good to me. I think this has all the things we expect to show up in this equation. So what do we have? Um, looks like the n squares are going to cancel. It's n squared. Uh, it looks like the l squares are going to, it's, it's not l squared though, is it? So it's not actually going to cancel. It's going to be l squared over l. So I think what we'll get is 1 half. There's a mu naught divided by mu naught squared, so we'll have a mu naught down here. Um, there's still an A. There's an L squared over L, so that's going to end up being L up the top. And then what's left? Just B. B squared, right? Okay, now our goal was to get energy over volume. We've got volume now, though. A times L is volume, right? The volume of our um, system is the volume of the solenoid is A times L. So we can divide that to the left-hand side here to get that the energy that's stored in the inductor divided by the area times the length, which again is volume, is equal to B squared over 2 mu naught. The symbol that books like to use for this is U sub B. The idea is this is a lowercase U and this is an uppercase U. I probably could have been better about how I define that. But this ends up being our answer for the energy that's stored inside of a magnetic field. So we call this the magnetic field's energy density, or magnetic energy density.
There we go. Anyone have any questions? So what does it say? It says that the energy stored in a magnetic field is basically just the magnetic field squared divided by two. It's a pretty simple relationship, right? Just B squared over two. Sure, there's a mu naught that shows up right here and we could actually, yeah, but uh, it's basically just magnetic field squared. Those of you that are taking um, physics 1D, you probably did some things where you talked about the square of the magnetic field or the square of the electric field of a light wave, right? May have been a while now, maybe you don't remember. Definitely, yeah, okay. When we talk about light waves, let's see if I can get this right, because it's been a while since I talked about this, but when we talk about light waves, um, in this class we'll, we'll get there, but we never really measure the um, magnetic field or the electric field of the light wave. We always measure the magnetic field squared or the electric field squared. Um, just in practice, that's what ends up happening. Does anyone remember what the energy density of the electric field was? Do you remember what that one was? It's really similar. It has an E squared. Q squared over 2R, not quite. That is the energy between, I don't know about the 2 and the denominator, but it's basically that, that would be kind of the energy between two charges, right? The energy stored between two charges, yeah. Epsilon, yeah, so it's it's really similar to this. The energy stored in an electric field was 1 half epsilon naught times E squared. So that's the energy density for the electric field. You can see they're really similar to each other. This one has epsilon naught up here, this one has mu naught down here, but I mean, at the end of the day, they're, they're really similar to each other, right? And it's not too surprising that the epsilon naught would be in the numerator, whereas the mu naught would be in the denominator. Uh, because I think um, the way that these things show up in our equations is kind of exactly the opposite, right? So if you think of the, um, uh, what is it, the force between two charges, or let's do electric field. Electric field was uh, like 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught multiplied by like Q over R squared, right? But the magnetic fields, the mu naught shows up in the numerator, right? Um, just as an example, the magnetic field um, of the problem that we did at the beginning of class was like mu naught I over two pi R. Right, so the epsilon naught's in the denominator, mu naught's in the numerator, they show up down here. It's probably not too surprising that they're kind of opposite to each other. Okay. I think the first problem we have isn't until we get to LR circuits. So that is uh, something that you'll, you'll, you'll see show up in a problem maybe, like where you, you have to use this information. Um, and these things will definitely show up when we get to the LC circuits. Okay, I think this is as good a time as any to show you this video on inductor basics. Inductor. We did not show this last time, did we? I don't think we did. I had it queued up to show, but I don't think we did. Change windows. <laughs> I do this every time. Change windows. Click on this window. Go live. All right. Let me know if there's no sound, but I think it should be working. Welcome to my first video about inductors. So what's an inductor? Generally speaking, an inductor is a device that temporarily stores energy in the form of a magnetic field. Inductors are usually just coils of wire, and one of the basic properties of electromagnetism is that when you have current flowing through a wire, you'll create a small magnetic field around it. So if you coil up a lot of wire, you'll get a stronger magnetic field. When current first starts to flow through the coil, a magnetic field starts to expand, then stabilizes, and then you've got some energy stored in the magnetic field. When current stops flowing, the magnetic field starts to collapse, and the magnetic energy gets turned back into electrical energy. So they're kind of like a temporary storage area for energy. You know how capacitors store energy in the form of a static charge and resist sudden changes in voltage? Well, inductors are very similar. They store energy in the form of a magnetic field and resist sudden changes in current. And if you only learn one thing from this video, remember, 
The current in an inductor cannot instantly change. It always lags by a certain amount of time. Now let me give you an example. Normally when you connect a voltage source to a load resistor, the current will be given by Ohm's law. In this case, 10 volts divided by 20 ohms gives you half an amp. And for this demo, I'm going to be using a 50% duty cycle square wave. So half the time you'll get 0.5 amps flowing, and half the time there'll be no current flowing. Okay, so here's the 1 kilohertz input square wave. And here's the current waveform. I'm just going to say real quickly what you're looking at here. This is a... Anyone know what this is? I bet Mr. Meowers knows what this is. It's an oscilloscope, that's right. An oscilloscope is a device that basically um, allows you to read um, what the current looks like in your system, and it can be really helpful when you have these type of alternating current systems. Here the current, as he said, goes from 2.5 amps to 0 amps, 2.5 amps to 0 amps, right? It's an Agilent. You know what the brand is? Oh, it, you've, you've seen these brands before? That's funny. The ones we have at school, we have a bunch of these at school. We, we would have done some labs with these at school. Um, but uh, you've just heard of them. Ah, oh, okay. It's like, a, is it a good one? Is it a Agilent a good one? Okay. So so again, that's this is this is kind of showing you the waveform um, associated with your, your current here. And you could, you could read some things off of this, probably. Uh, 3.96 volts is probably the scale. Um... 500 microseconds per, maybe? Maybe each division represents 500 microseconds? Or half of a millisecond? Usually you can read out exactly... You're not seeing the whole thing here. Usually you can see, like, all of the... Yeah, but it's just a graph. All you're, all you're seeing here is basically a graph. Okay. Graph of current or voltage as a function of time. Also perfectly square. Now watch what happens when I add a 5 millihenry inductor in series with the circuit. All of a sudden the square wave isn't so square anymore. There's a little bit of lag in the current. And this is because it takes a certain amount of time to store and release the energy in an inductor. Now let's try that again with a higher input frequency of 10 kHz. Now it's even more obvious that the inductor is impeding the sudden changes in current. This happens more and more as I raise the frequency of the input wave. At 100 kHz, there is no square wave anymore. It takes a longer time to store and release the energy in the inductor than the time it takes for the input wave to switch from high to low. So in this situation, the inductor is starting to average out the current over time. And this is very useful. It forms the basis of LC low-pass filters, which I'll cover in another video. But just to give you a quick example, if I add a 1000 microfarad capacitor just after the inductor here, I get a very clean DC output from a square wave input. And this is what good power supplies use to smooth out voltage. And to prove to you that all this happens because of expanding and collapsing magnetic fields, I'm going to feed a square wave into this unshielded inductor here. And I'm going to use another inductor as a magnetic probe, so I can view any magnetic field changes on the oscilloscope. On top I have the input wave, and on the bottom you can see the magnetic field that I'm picking up as I get closer to the inductor. Finally, inductors have almost no effect on DC. Let's watch that again. You can see so I don't know if it's super clear what's happening here. And so I'm going to use another inductor as a magnetic probe. So, I so just to be really clear what's happening here, the lower inductor is connected to the voltage source, right? I, I wish we could... Uh, I mean, I can do this. We could have done this demo at the school. It's unfortunate I can't show it to you because it's really neat. So the, the bottom one is the only one that actually has power flowing through it, right? Does that make sense? The upper one is just connected to the oscilloscope, so it's designed to just read out what's happening. And you can get an idea of what's happening here, because the, the bottom current coil, he's saying that there's a, there's a current that goes on and then off, and then on and then off. So it's switching, right? That means that there's going to be a change in flux, right? This is what we learned with Lenz's Law. There's a change in flux through the upper coil. That change in flux is going to induce an EMF. And that induced EMF can be read out on the oscilloscope. So yeah, this is this is uh, this is effectively what happens when you take your phone, you put it on one of those wireless charging stations. Is that there's an oscillating current in an inductor below? You have an inductor in your phone that's kind of what's called like the pickup coil, and it's used to um, well transfer power from one to the other. That's what you're seeing, right? What he's reading out here on this next slide is next slide, whatever. The next portion of the video is. Um, 
the um, the current that's being induced in the upper coil. I can view any magnetic field changes on the oscilloscope. On top I have the input wave, and on the bottom you can see the magnetic field that I'm picking up as I get closer to the inductor. He says it's a magnetic field, but what's being what's being read out here is is just voltage, right? So it's showing that uh, well, yeah, you've got you've got an induced voltage. Now it's not nearly as smooth as the other one. The other one is coming from a um, you know power source, so it's very nice and square. Not exactly square because it does have an inductor in the system, so there are these kind of changes here. But uh, anyway, it's pretty cool. Finally, inductors have almost no effect on DC. They're basically just pieces of wire with a resistance of a few milliohms. Alright, that's the basics of how an inductor works. Now, I've got a couple more videos with more info on them and some practical examples. So if you want to read more about his uh, stuff, this is Afrotech Mods, and he's got some good videos. There's a lot of really great videos on YouTube for for this stuff that go into a lot more detail about uh, how a lot of these things might be used in engineering applications and uh, all that stuff. So is this the same one? I can't remember. No, it's a different one. Okay. All right. That's also similar to like what Mr. Meowers was mentioning too. Like you can see very clearly in that video how just having a coil in one circuit that's nearby another circuit that has a changing current can can induce an EMF that that could be possibly harmful to the circuit. It could create noise. It could create like uh, static interference maybe with your uh, system and stuff like that. I think yeah. Very bad if you have critical sensors. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's do LR circuits, and then after we do LR circuits, we'll take a bit of a break. Thank you. I will uh, open it back up again. So here's an RL circuit. LR, RL, doesn't really matter what order we say in it. It's just, it's a circuit that contains an inductor and a resistor attached to some type of EMF source. Okay. So we're gonna be looking at the S1 portion of this. This is called an RL circuit. And we wanna kind of understand um, what the current in such a circuit might look like. So the first thing we're going to look at is what it looks like when we close the circuit with S1 right here. I don't know what just happened there. So if the circuit is closed with S1 and S2 open, then we're going to have a current that flows from A to B and then from B to C and back around this way. What we're going to do is we're going to use um, Kirchhoff's, uh, Kirchhoff's laws to indicate what's happening with the circuit here. So we're going to say that um, Kirchhoff's law for this loop right here, and we're going to travel the loop in this direction. Uh, when I go from this portion to this portion, what do I write down? Do I write down positive E or do I write down negative E? When I go from the negative side to the positive side. Do you remember? Positive, that's right, yeah. So we write E. So again, we're using the loop rule here. What about the resistor R? When I go from A to B, what do I get? It's either negative IR or it's positive IR, right? Negative, that's right, because you're going downstream, if you don't remember. You're going from a higher potential to a lower potential because the current is flowing from left to right. And then for the inductor right here, I'm just going to kind of say without any proof that what we're going to write down right here is I times uh, D. Oh, no, no, not I, sorry, sorry. The EMF across an inductor was given by L times the time rate of change of the current. And this is going to give us a, a differential equation that we can solve because we have a constant EMF E, we have a current I, supposedly a constant resistance, a constant inductance, and then another uh, derivative of that current. So this makes a differential equation, right? One thing I'm going to say here is... Uh, 
Um, you know what? Let's do this. Let's do the derivation first, and then I'm going to come back and we'll talk about what I just did, what I just wrote down right here, because I think that there's there's a bit of a lie within what I'm saying here, but it can be fixed with Faraday's law. All right. So um, we want to solve this here to find uh, the current as a function of time. That's what our goal is. And it's going to end up looking kind of similar to what we saw in the, the video there. So in order to do that, what I need to do is to separate the di and the dt and get the i and the di together. So we'll write this as e minus ir is equal to uh, l times di dt. For some reason, I feel like I need to multiply both sides by negative. But if it doesn't work out, we'll just come back and do that at the end. I think this should be fine to do this like this. We're going to multiply the, D to the dt to the left side and divide by L. Do I want to get the r by itself? I don't think so. So let's write it like this. So we'll have dt divided by L equal to di over e minus ir. Yeah, I'm pretty sure your book writes these, like it multiplies negative to both sides, but we'll, just, we'll leave it like this and see what happens. All right. Now we need to integrate both sides. Um, I'm going to integrate from, let's just use a capital I. From zero up to some current I. Now I choose zero at the bottom here because in our initial state of our system, there was no current flowing. We just had a battery and we closed the switch and there was no current at that moment. And the current's going to build up to some current that we're going to call I. And on the left hand side, we'll just go from zero to like T prime, just so that the variable is not the same as this right here. On the left side, we'll end up getting uh, t oops. We'll just get t prime over l. Uh, the right hand side. What are we going to get when we do this integral right here? Something like a negative natural log, right? Does that look right? Take the derivative of this, you're going to get 1 over e minus ir, multiply with the derivative of the inside, which is negative r, so that'll cancel out with this and this. I think we get that. 0 to i. Uh, let's multiply by the r to the left side. Let's multiply the negative sign as well. So we'll have negative r t over l. The t prime is like a dummy variable, so it's just we'll just replace it with t. Um, oh, and we got to plug in our variables now. So now we're going to have um, 0 to i. So it's going to be the natural log of uh, e minus big I r. And then minus the natural log of just e. So that'll be negative rt over l natural log of e minus i r divided by e. Everything look okay to everyone? If I done anything wrong, did I drop a minus sign or anything like that? Yeah, I R in this case. Oh, is it equal to E? Um, I'm really going to kind of think of this current as being the current at some point in time. I, I is the current at some point in time. Um, yeah, so maybe after some long period of time, these two terms will be equal to each other. But yeah. Uh, okay, now we want to solve this. Um, we need to raise both sides to the e power. So what we'll get, let's start again up here. Uh, the left-hand side becomes e to the negative rt over l. And the right-hand side now is just e minus ir divided by e. Multiply by the emf to the left-hand side. So we get e, e to the negative rt over l equal to e minus ir. I want to solve this for i, so we'll basically just add this to the left side, move this to the right side. So we end up getting i times r is equal to divided 
divide both sides by r, factor out the e. This will give us our final answer that the current as a function of time is going to be equal to e over r times 1 minus e to the negative rt divided by l. And there we go. What does that look like? This would be charging the inductor. Good question. That's not really charging. So I'll put a, I'll put air quotes on that, but it's it's not a, it's not a bad way to think about it. This is like building up the magnetic field of the inductor. It's like when the magnetic field is growing. So we'll just say we'll put charging in air quotes here, but it's not a bad way to think about it because this is very similar to the charging of a uh, capacitor for sure. Um, what does that look like? It looks like this. So if I plot i as a function of time, and we think about what uh, the value of the current is at t equal to zero, plug t equal to zero, you get one minus one, which is zero. And that means the current is zero, so we start at zero. And then as time goes on, if we put t equal to infinity, e to the negative infinity is zero, and we'll just get e over r. So what happens is the current kind of slowly builds up like this to a fixed, so it asymptotically will approach or realistically it will very quickly approach a value of i equal to e over r right here. And there we go. Uh, within this system right here, we can take that equation and we can write it in a slightly different way by introducing a different parameter for the time uh, portion of it here. We can say, uh, let uh, the time constant tau be equal to what would be L over R in this case. This is gonna be our, our time constant. If you look at the units of L over R, um, you'll, you'll actually get seconds. I believe that the units, so I, I think one Henry is equal to um, an ohm times a second. And then obviously a resistance is measured in ohms. So ohm seconds over ohms gives you seconds. Uh, and this is basically going to be the time that it takes for the current to reach, I believe, 63% of its maximum value. So this would be this would occur somewhere right here, at which point the current at this point right here is going to be about 0 0.63 multiplied by uh, E over R. About 63% of the maximum current. This is the time that it takes to reach 63% of the maximum current. And to understand where that comes from, if I plug one tau right into this equation right here, um, if you put t equal to tau, you're gonna get r over l times l over r, which is one. So you get one minus e to the negative one. This would be the current at one tau, one time constant basically. And 1 minus e to the negative 1, if you put that into your calculator, I think you're going to get um, 0 0.63, 0 0.632 or something like that, probably. I'm just going to check real quick, because I could have I could have messed that up. My phone is not recognizing my fingerprint. All right, so 1 minus e to the negative 1. I should really get, like, just a regular calculator. So I'll have to unlock it. 1 minus e to the negative 1. Yeah, 0 0.632. Thank you, Mr. Miyamars. So there we go. That is uh, what an inductor does. It, it makes it so that the current does not instantly jump up to its final value. It takes some time. Okay, And the time that it takes is basically dependent upon these two quantities right here. Uh, the larger the value of the resistance, okay, the smaller the time constant is going to be. And the bigger that the value of the inductance, the bigger the time constant is going to be. Let's see if we understand that. So why would it be the case that a large inductor, a large inductor would be, what would that be? Okay, what's a large inductor? It would be something. Okay, let's look back to this definition right here. Lots of coils, exactly, that's, that's exactly right. N is the number of coils. The more coils you have, the bigger the inductance is gonna be, right? These other things matter as well, but the number of coils matters the most because it shows up as squared in the equation. So does it make sense that it would take a long time for the current to build up if the inductance is big. 
Does that make sense? Sure, right? Because big inductance means that it's going to take really long to get the current pushing through the circuit. And um, yeah. What about the R being in the denominator? Why is the R in the denominator? The bigger the resistance of the circuit, the smaller the time constant is going to be. Why would that be the case? What do y'all think? weaker magnetic field because more resistance what does that mean about the what does that mean about the final current the final current is going to be smaller too right you know less current less current means that yeah you know, the the buildup of that current is uh gonna be a smaller change right because you're going from just think about this you're going from zero to e over r right so think about going from zero to e over 10 let's say versus going from 0 to uh, e over 100, right? Um, this, is a, this is a bigger change, right? And this is a small change. And since what the, what the inductor is going to do in the circuit is determine how rapidly you can go from this value to this value if it's a smaller step, right? If you don't need to increase the current as much, then... Uh, um, the inductor's not going to kind of do as much, basically, so it's it's going to be easier for the current to, to reach that that maximum value. That's an LR circuit. We can also talk about what happens in the other portion of this circuit, if you want to. Um, I'm going to leave the derivation to you, but if we if we then open this one back up and simultaneously close this one over here, with the current still flowing in the same direction. The current is now going to decay. The inductor is now going to become effectively your power source at this point, and it's going to start delivering energy to your circuit. And if you're if you're discharging it, the equation you end up getting is that the current as a function of time is going to go as e over r. Now, what does e over r mean now? If you don't have the EMF source, but this so this is often written just like this. It's often written as just uh, like e. I naught, which is like the initial current flowing in the system at time equal to zero times e to the negative, and then it looks exactly the same, tr divided by l. Okay. And of course, what that one's going to look like is just like the one above, except for it's a decaying current that's going to start off some point right here, and it's going to go like this, kind of like what we saw in the video, where this is going to be I naught, this is time, and that's current on that axis. That makes sense. So it either exponentially grows or exponentially decays. And in either case, uh, those are your equations for them. The circuit is like really, really similar to an RC circuit, right? It's really similar. There's a couple differences. In the case of the RC circuit, the current eventually stops flowing, right? And what you're interested in that one was charge as a function of time or voltage as a function of time. In this circuit, the current continues to flow, which is why we're plotting current as a function of time instead of charge. So anyway, there we go. Anyone have any questions? All right. Shall we take a break and then do a problem? Put the problem on the screen, that way you can try it yourself if you want to. And we'll just take a short break. Look, let's see if I can put all this stuff together on the screen. There we go. Almost. All right, so let's take a break. Uh, we started at about 30 after, so we can go for 55 minutes. This is a good time to take a break. We'll take a break until 7.35.